thank you all for joining us today. This is the last uh, regular uh, digital lag seminar combination webinar uh, of the spring 2022 season. Uh, just to remind you, of course, these are Purdue Agriculture sponsored, a little bit inspired by the WIN project, the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network. Um, and uh, of course, we featured a, a variety of topics related to digital agriculture, data science for ag, and that sort of thing. So we're very happy uh, to close out this uh, season, if you will, just as we're starting the growing season uh, with Dr. Christian Cruz from uh, Botany and Plant Pathology. You can see a little bit of his background there. Uh, very excited to hear how he is using uh, some advanced technology to improve how we manage uh, in crop production. So Christian, thank you for sharing. Uh, looking forward to learning some new things today. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks everybody for coming today. So those of you connected and those of you attending in person. Okay, so I wanted to provide a very um, a brief introduction because I'm, I'm pretty sure that many of you um, have been catch up over what we have been doing over the past four years. So this seminar is, is basically uh, an explanation of what we have accomplished over, over the time. Uh, last four years. I wanted to give also uh, an introduction on, on how this seminar is going to go. So I'm going to be explaining a few things related to what we have done in terms of generating basic and applied uh, knowledge associated with plant disease epidemics, especially with those, those diseases that, that we study, uh, five diseases, the wheat blast disease and tar spot form. But also what we have done, as, as Dennis said, uh, what we, we've done in terms of developing high testing um, and high performance methods for uh, foliar disease phenotyping, uh, which is a relatively new area of research. And so there's, there's much that needs to be done, but we have accomplished a little bit of, of that. And finally, uh, what we've done in terms of integrating uh, and coordinating activities across scientific and engineering domains. So, which is another component that I will, I will speak briefly about the needs of, of combining these two, these two domains. But before I start, I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page in terms of concepts. So what is a disease? There, there are many uh, people that uh, probably this is not the area of the research, but so here we're looking at any mal malfunctioning host cells and tissues that results from a continuous irritation by a pathogenic agent. And so the ultimate outcome of these are symptoms. And so this is what we do in pathology, not only in, in plant pathology, but also in human and animal pathology. We're looking for symptoms. Um, what is an epidemic? And so again, there are multiple concepts and ways on how to describe these. But so here we're looking at changes in disease intensity in host population in time and space. And uh, we can start thinking about increases instead of change. Uh, and also, sometimes we can drop the, the portion of space and focus primarily on the temporal aspects, which is something that we have done primarily in, in our lab, but uh, uh, we are very close to publish our first paper uh, by using the spatial and temporal analysis for describing epidemics. Okay, so going back to the temporal analysis, uh, remember that the type of data that we're collecting are always associated to what is happening at the population level, at the plant population level. So we're not looking at individuals, but at data coming from the entire population. So in our case, we use different techniques. Uh, one of those includes uh, disease progress curves and different parameters that can be extracted from those disease progress curves. And so that is very important, especially for uh, modeling, forecasting, et cetera. I also wanted to share a little bit um, about the, the, the common concept of the plant disease triangle, which is nothing new, but there are revisions about what this concept is about. So this paper was published uh, back in 2020, not from our group, but from, from, from a different group. Um, but I wanted to highlight a, a couple of things here. So the disease triangle, we know that primarily encompasses three elements, susceptible host, a virulent pathogen and the right environmental conditions that can sustain that population of the pathogen. 
and obviously for disease um, to develop um, over time. We know that there are anthropogenic effects that can impact the multiple interactions and the ultimate outcome uh, coming from these disease triangles. So um, one of them, we can start thinking about climate change, for example, so how temperatures are changing in different locations, um, maybe the humidity, um, um, maybe soil nutrient in many cases, etc. But so uh, remember that this is a dynamic concept. It's not, there's nothing static about the disease triangle. Uh, but for now, this is just for today, we are going to be uh, simplifying the concepts and looking at the very basic aspects of the disease triangle. So susceptible host, virulent pathogen, and environmental conditions conducive for disease to occur. So once we have those three elements, we can start looking at what is happening at the, uh, at the plant population level. And, and so this is where we define the scouting methods and protocols to start collecting data. Primarily everything that is that has been done uh, uh, is basically based on visual assessments, but we know that there are multiple limitations of what humans can do. And, and, and this is where we want to expand uh, the, uh, especially the throughput, the levels of throughputs and, and the data that we can collect. We also have to realize that although some efforts have been made in terms of uh, extending the disease triangle to encompass the dimensions of time and space, there are still limitations, especially when we are collecting data visually. So we know that no human being will be capable of collecting every single data coming from the field. And so that's where we are going to need better technologies and, and better methods in the future. And this is where my lab is, is moving towards, thinking that at some point we will be capable of uh, using next generation spatial temporal analysis. However, we're not there yet. We need the tools that will allow us to, to do such a thing. And so a little bit of, of my background, uh, I got a master's and PhD degrees in plant pathology, Ohio State University, Kansas State University. At, at K-State, I had the opportunity to work in partnership with collaborators doing biosecurity research. And so I spent uh, more than a decade working in a biocontainment facility. I had the chance to visit um, um, uh, other countries and, uh, and see and actually collect data associated with plant disease epidemics, particularly the wheat blast disease. But so as I arrived uh, in uh, West Lafayette and so I started working for Purdue, um, uh, there has been a tremendous uh, opening of, of multiple opportunities, especially uh, interacting with engineers and, and people with different backgrounds that are helping us to move forward with the different ideas that, that we're proposing here. Another manuscript that I wanted to share with you, again, not from my group. Uh, so this was published in, in 2020. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that um, plant diseases and plant pathogens are emerging in multiple locations. Sometimes they are not their original location, but we're looking at different places, different times, uh, and so one example here, one of the many, they include the wheat loss disease, uh, which is one of the diseases that we're going to be uh, in today. But I was surprised that they didn't include tar spot of corn. So this disease was detected for the first time in 1904 in Mexico. And uh, it wasn't until 2015 that uh, it was detected for the first time here in the US. And so there are many questions on why it took so much time for that to occur, what are the conditions, what are the variables associated with, with that emergence of that particular disease. But so there are many other examples. Um, so some of the um, thinkings in terms of what, why is this happening is that there are many anthropogenic factors that are increasing the likelihood of the emergence of these diseases in new areas. Uh, we can think of host shifts in many cases. So um, uh, sometimes even natural aerial dispersal or even weather events that are changing in, in multiple locations. Agricultural intensification will be only one in here. Okay, so our last manuscript from other groups and then I'll move on into 
what we've done. So this is an interesting uh, manuscript recently published. And so uh, if you see the names here, there are, there are many world renowned authorities. And uh, one of them is Dr. Chris Gilligan from the University of Cambridge. By the way, he's gonna be giving a seminar next week. So I invite you to attend to that seminar. So he's an epidemiologist. Uh, he has tremendous experience working with uh, frost diseases and many other diseases around the world. In any case, so um, here what they are discussing is that we definitely need better surveillance networks and systems that could allow us to make decisions uh, mainly in real or if not near real time. But again, we're not there yet. We're still building and putting together the pieces of the puzzle. But the idea here is that we have to start from somewhere. So in my case, um, I have uh, direct experience with transportation networks, weather and climate parameters, um, sensors, as I have mentioned before, disease modeling, et cetera. We are gonna, not gonna have time to cover all those different aspects. However, we are going to focus primarily on the work on sensors and also on disease model. Okay, but before I start, um, there's another aspect that we have to acknowledge here and is that there is, there is a lack of information and sometimes even deceitful perception that are not allowing to make the right decisions. So here we're, we're thinking about plant diseases. Several generalizations, not only from growers, but also from uh, even researchers at times. So some assumptions, for example, certain symptoms are not important in the critical phases. The disease is very explosive and does not give time to control it. Symptoms appear out of nowhere. That's, that's very typical, right? So the reality is that there are processes. And so, but unfortunately, in many cases, we don't count with the data to uh, make the right observations and make the right conclusions. And so this is where we need to start thinking about um, what type of data is required to characterize adequately those epidemics. In epidemiology, we know that there are different types of epidemics, monocyclic, polycyclic, but you know, those are very basic types of information. But you will be surprised that in many cases, we don't even count with the data to characterize those epidemics. And so this is something that we have started to do with the systems that, that we're studying. So what do we do in our lab? Uh, we definitely collect information at both the temporal and the spatial levels primarily using uh, visual assessments of plant diseases. We're um, focusing primarily on corn and wheat diseases. For the temporal information, so as I had mentioned before, disease progress curves, um, population growth models um, can allow us to characterize the different types of epidemics. And so that's important from a management perspective. It's not the same <clears throat> managing a monocyclic disease compared to a polycyclic disease, for example. Uh, but also the spatial information is providing us an, another type of uh, uh, piece of, of data and, and information that can help us also describe where, where hotspots are occurring. What can we do in terms of uh, detecting and even managing those hotspots in, in, in on time? So there are many aspects that we have learned, but so right now we're moving towards the um, different types of technologies available, especially collecting data using UAVs and, and also from the ground using cameras to collect imagery, develop algorithms that at some point uh, can help us with, with the level of throughput that we need. Um, over the past few months, actually, so, and uh, there, there has been a collaboration with uh, a local company, so Solem Tech, and uh, we're about to start collecting. Let me, let me give you a call back. I'm, I'm gonna make a video, all right? A robotic platform. I love you. So we don't have that yet, but uh, the idea is that we're moving towards those levels of uh, technologies. We know that pathogen spread is an ecological process driven by multiple factors and systems that are very, very complex. We are, are in need of uh, careful integration, scientific uh, fields, and also the engineering fields to move that forward. So why is this important um, from a practical standpoint? So if we don't understand 
uh, epidemic growth rates, it's going to be difficult to extend the durability of the tactics that we're currently using. So one of those tactics would be your um, cultivars that possess different levels of resistance. Uh, another tactic would be the use of, of pesticides, fungicides, etc. So, so let's think about these. We know that the, there's a breeding cycle. And so um, we start usually uh, collaborating with breeders, uh, selecting um, different materials and different germplasms that will ultimately help us uh, develop and, and even release cultivars that can help us reduce the likelihood of uh, major effects. But so that cycle, we know that um, in most cases consists of boom and bust cycles. So eventually the cultivar will succumb to diseases. And so we have seen that happen before. Now, the question is um, for how many years we can keep a cultivar or can we keep a, a specific target? So that's always a question. Uh, and, and the second point here is that, so even if we don't come with a uh, highly resistant cultivar, so in many cases, the, the producers decide to even plant relative susceptible cultivars because they're high yielding. Um, so in those cases, we decide to use integrated management strategies. So combinations of um, uh, different tactics, including chemicals, or even combinations of uh, resistance levels, et cetera. Uh, but again, so if we don't understand the rates of disease change, so uh, we might be making decisions without the right amount of information, and we could be losing money too. So uh, another aspect uh, that is important here is to consider the impacts of the overuse of pesticides for the environment. And so therefore we require better tools, better information to truly understand the, the different rates on which these epidemics are occurring. Okay, so let's start talking in more detail about these two systems, the wheat blast disease and tar spot of corn. Um, so wheat blast, as I had mentioned before, is a relatively new disease. Uh, is in full expansion right now, present in three continents. Uh, is it still exotic in the US, so we haven't detected it here. Uh, but there are, uh, there is information that is uh, uh, it's telling us that, that the environment uh, in some parts of the U.S. are conducive for the establishment and the development of outbreaks for these diseases. Star spot, again, is relatively new in the U.S., but it's a little bit uh, uh, of a perennial threat in Mexico and in other areas throughout the Americas. Uh, emerged as a, um, as a disease in 2015, in 2018, and in 2021, there were uh, several epidemics, and uh, the growers actually uh, are I'm very afraid of, of that disease at that point. What are the commonalities of these two diseases? So first, very little information. So not much is known in terms of the temporal and the spatial development of symptoms of these two diseases. And uh, uh, perhaps that lack of understanding has exacerbated problems uh, and significantly challenged the growers uh, in terms of making the adequate and the right decisions when uh, the symptoms are happening. Um, and so I'm going to be presenting some evidence that shows uh, different dynamics and, and, and evidence um, um, and different pieces of information that are telling us how these epidemics are actually happening. So let's start with the wheat blast disease. So a little bit of the symptoms uh, you can see here from, from this image is a completely devastated field. Um, some of the questions that came uh, the first time that we started working with this pathosystem was how is it possible that a, a pathogen can affect an entire field almost synchronously? And so what you're seeing here are those spikes that are completely affected by the pathogen. And, and again, so this, this goes back to the comment. So this disease came out of nowhere. Uh, um, there was little time before uh, we could do something. And so many growers were losing uh, their production. And so there were many questions, but the reality is that the quality of the, of the grain is highly affected, especially if the growers were planting highly susceptible cultivars. 
Uh, on this image on the left, you can see the quality of the grain that is highly affected when the disease strikes. This is something that the growers try to avoid, especially because they can have penalties when they are trying to sell their grain. Okay, so another aspect is that the, the pathogen is seed borne, so that adds another problem. So you're, if you're planting uh, infected seeds, uh, you can end up with, um, with a serious issue down the road. Another aspect that has not been discussed in the literature um, was what, what was the relevance of infection on leaves? And so that's something that my group started to, to ask um, um, back in the day. So we had already published several papers about that. But so at the beginning, we didn't have a complete picture of the disease cycle. We knew that there were a few sources or, or potential sources of inoculum, so including infected seed or infected residue and even um, um, alternate hosts that could be harboring the pathogen, et cetera. At some point, uh, we're going to have enough inoculum that will generate this type of epidemic that we were seeing uh, in the field. But so again, many questions uh, were still there. And so back in 2015, we published this manuscript that talks about the importance of inoculum present on, on lower leaves, actually, in the basal parts of the plant. Had not been re uh, reported before, but what we had seen was that independently on, on the cultivar, so you could be growing a highly resistant cultivar or even a highly susceptible cultivar, you're going to have uh, a good amount of inoculum present in your field. So again, something that had not been reported before, but now the question was about what was the relationship of leaf infection with spike infections? And so whether we were dealing with a polycyclic disease or a monocyclic type of disease. And so we have been working uh, on this together with Dr. Gongor and actually some of my students ever since and generating additional evidence, uh, characterizing amounts of inoculum, et cetera, different cultivars. So we're seeing the trends in here. But so that information helped us to also start asking other questions uh, related to the temporal dynamics of root mass. And so uh, back in those days, we didn't have any information that would help us determine, okay, so is this a post-cyclic, monocyclic? How are the disease progress curves looking like? And especially, so whether we could collect information using multispectral imagery to characterize those epidemics. And so here in this very brief video, and hopefully you're, you're seeing it, probably taking a while to load. Um, yeah, I don't think you're seeing that video, unfortunately. But anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that experimental design. So the design consisted on, on a randomized complete block design. And what we had done here was, that's too bad. That's very delayed. So let's wait here. OK, very good. So what we had done here was that we um, established this experimental design. And so the blue tarps that you're seeing on your screen correspond to uh, those areas that we had inoculated with the pathogen. And so uh, we had some plots that were not inoculated, other plots were inoculated with the pathogen. So the question here was, how will the epidemics develop providing these different treatments? And, and so in this picture, that's me right there in the middle of the night preparing inoculum uh, prior to inoculation. And, and so um, something also important here is that we collected a tremendous amount of visual information to characterize these epidemics. Uh, six time points during the vegetative times and, and, and periods, and eight time points during the reproductive periods of the plant. Um, 100 spikes per plot per, per time. So that's a lot of data points that, that we had to collect. Uh, but we were fortunate that we, uh, we had collaborators that were willing to do that heavy work. So the data was collected visually, but also um, we were fortunate to have another collaborator, in this case, Jesse Pollan from Kansas State University at that time. So he provided his UAV and, and we sent our technician and dress crews down to South America and he collected information primarily during the 
the reproductive stages. So again, very briefly, what we accomplished here was two things in a single project. One, we characterized wheat loss epidemics um, with information coming from leaves and also from spikes. But we also were able to compare the assessments that the human readers had made against those, uh, those data points that we had collected um, and extracted from multispectral imagery. And so there were many questions related to what was the accuracy, what was the precision, what was the bias when you were um, collecting and, uh, and actually extracting information from those images? So um, to do that part of the work, um, we, we started to collaborate closely with Jesse Pollan's group and they have developed some pipelines and, and helped us with data extraction, particularly with uh, Daljit Singh, his, his uh, grad student. Uh, but so going back to the visual uh, information. So what we had done in terms of characterizing those epidemics, visual assessments. So um, one thing that we did, and so this was done by using population growth models. We identified a couple of models that were able to characterize those epidemics. And so it turns out that those models are associated with all cyclic diseases. So gumpers and logistics, uh, exponential and monomolecular Pretty much, we're not we're not good at uh, fitting the data. But for the other portion of of the work, so uh, we had extracted and uh, obtained different vegetation indices, uh, several of them. But uh, long story short, we uh, identified one particular uh, index that was capable to provide the highest levels of precision, accuracy, and the lowest levels of uh, of bias at actually both locations. Now, one uh, limitation we had here was that uh, we had decided to um, uh, characterize these data sets at different time points. And so we had not uh, done a, a cumulative analysis of the entire data sets uh, by treatments, but, but that's something that we started to do in, in the past few months uh, with one student from the National University of Columbia uh, his background is in statistics, and uh, so he uh, he and I sat down one day and started reanalyzing these data sets. Uh, and so very interestingly, so we, what we had done here was that we still wanted to do the comparison of uh, precision, accuracy, and bias when you compare multispectral data versus visual information. And uh, so not only from the perspective of uh, the amount of disease, but also uh, the different rates associated with the disease prosper. So initial amount of disease, maximum amount of disease, and the rate of change over time. And, and so we're finding very interesting values, high levels of accuracy, high levels of precision, low levels uh, of bias at each of these two locations, depending on the two treatments that we had analyzed. But there are other aspects that we consider are novel because so in, in our res um, area of research, um, so far there's not a standard method that um, tell us how to analyze the data coming from imagery. And so how we can uh, extract different parameters associated with those progress curves that are being plotted coming from multispectral data in this particular case. And so this is the first time that we had started to compare the different shapes, the different parameters uh, uh, across the different methods. So um, the, uh, this information is not published yet, but I just wanted to share it with you. So uh, because that allow us uh, to, to think what can be done in the future with this type of information. OK, so. Um, Another project with Dr. Carlos Gongora. So uh, again, we traveled down to South America, um, primarily because that's where these hotspots of, of wheat blast exist. Um, uh, we process information coming from two locations. Uh, the main questions that we were trying to address here was whether we could characterize epidemics both at the spatial and the temporal levels, something that we had not done 
uh, in the past. And so this manuscript has been accepted and we're working on, on, on some changes and uh, very soon we're gonna submit it uh, again. But so um, based on these two locations, actually, so one location was more prone for disease and epidemic development than the other one. So the conditions were just perfect for, for disease development. Uh, but in any case, so they, one, of, one of the other questions was whether there were differences in terms of how these epidemics were developing. Uh, and so as you are seeing here, A, B, or C corresponds to each of those locations that we had used. B corresponds to the cumulative or the accumulation of the information throughout the entire season. So meaning that we had characterized the epidemic considering what is happening on the leaves, but what also was happening on the spikes. And uh, there were clear differences, actually, especially for uh, location C, where the disease was developing at a definitely much faster rate. Uh, we had estimated those rates by using the logistic and uh, the Gompertz uh, population growth models. Very clear differences just right there. So, um, uh, but, but something new that uh, had never been reported before was what is what's actually happening in time and space, right? So when did the hotspot started, and what was the directionality and uh, how fast the disease was actually developing? And so this took quite a bit of time, uh, multiple trials, but so we were fortunate that Dr. Gombra was curious enough to look at multiple methods on how to characterize these epidemics. But again, so you can see here from, from these, uh, um, graph right here. So that corresponds to what was happening at the vegetative stages, right? So we are seeing that there are, there are multiple dynamics that are happening depending on, on the time. So the time corresponds to uh, these small values in here, 41, 56, six, uh, 62, and 71 days after uh, we had planted. And definitely we, we found differences by location as well. But so the striking factor here was what we had found during the reproductive stages. And so this is what usually the growers would, would be reporting. You know, a rapid change in disease intensity that basically is wiping out many of these fields. So um, what happens, so these dynamics during the vegetative stages are not very clear, are actually very subtle to the grower. And to the untrained eye, basically that amount of disease severity will not be detected. And so that is something that we have been trying to explain to the growers and you know, extension people to start looking very closely, even before those spikes are, are being formed. So again, this has implications in how these diseases are managed. But the reality is that to accomplish all this work, it took a long time, a lot of effort, a lot of training of people. And so that is telling us that we need much better tools to do something like this. We have the, the concepts, we have the methods to characterize what or, and how epidemics are developing, but it's more about the data. Can we collect the data uh, at a much faster pace? Okay, so we have also published many other papers. I won't have time to discuss each of them, but so I wanted to highlight this collaboration with uh, Dr. Mohammed Jahan Shahi uh, from Purdue. And so uh, my student, Mariela Fernandez, published this together with another student from, from his lab. And so here we're thinking about uh, methods that can help us collect information and perhaps increase the throughput. Um, so these methods were, uh, and actually the data that we have collected to develop this method uh, um, was performed under control environment. So we're not uh, talking about the field level, but at least the concept is here. So we, um, they had developed a classification method depending on the amount of disease present in, in those spikes, which might have implications for breeding purposes. Uh, breeders um, have to rely on phenotyping thousands and thousands of lines, even under controlled environments. 
Okay, so moving forward, uh, let's start talking about tar spot and what we have done with that system. Again, uh, um, there's much that we still need to learn in terms of the ecology, epidemiology, the biology of, of this, of the pathogen that causes tar spot. But what we know is that the pathogen can infect all plant parts. So that's, that's very clear. Um, another piece of information that we have is that infected residue can have a big impact on how the outbreaks are actually happening. Um, and so once the conditions are uh, conducive for this pathogen to thrive again, so the pathogen becomes active and infection will start once the susceptible host is present. Uh, but again, so there are, there are many, many questions that we still uh, need to ask, and, and especially, so what is the evidence that this pathogen is truly a polycyclic uh, a pathogen and disease? So unfortunately, we have done a little bit about that uh, to answer that question. And so this is again based on visual assessments uh, uh, in the field. So in this particular case, we run the population growth models, and we identified um, three models that are often associated with all cyclic diseases. Uh, definitely, we're not dealing with a monocyclic type of disease in here. So rapid development of, uh, of signs and symptoms. Uh, and that's why, how do you see those disease progress curves in many cases um, growing exponentially? Um, other questions that need to be answered, for example, uh, how did this pathogen arrive in the US? Was it here? for a long time before it, it uh, decided to uh, be problematic. Uh, so we're still trying to answer those questions. Uh, another question, are there all other sources of inoculum that might be present that had not been characterized so far? So there are, there are many questions, but we need to make progress here. And so uh, in this study, we uh, collaborated with Dr. Darcy Telenko uh, Dr. Tanko decided to run a long-term project, uh, multiple years, where she is testing different combinations of tactics, including fungicide treatments at different timings, different hybrids, uh, and also different management practices. So that information is helping growers uh, make decisions. But so um, uh, we discussed with Dr. Tlenko about um, collecting visual information from those plots, and we were fortunate to have that collaboration. Um, we, we then uh, uh, got in touch with Dr. Jing Hajong, and uh, he helped us collect multispectral data using a UAV. And uh, with that work, we were actually uh, um, very happy with, with the outcome, which I will show you. But for those of you who are not familiar with multispectral data and how this data can help you uh, extract information associated with diseases. So let's think about a field at the beginning of the season that is completely healthy. So when, when you uh, collect the data, and so you run some uh, analysis associated with vegetation indices. So the index is going to tell you um, something related with how healthy the tissue might be. Okay, so there are different scales in here that you can see. But later in the season, things will rapidly change, especially under these conditions where we have different treatments. Uh, the index can also uh, help you identify those areas where you might be seeing differences in your treatments. Unfortunately, the slots, one slide is not showing here, but uh, I hope that you get the idea here, okay, where. Um, the different types of uh, indices can help us ultimately to uh, determine whether there are differences or not. And so we can um, obtain multiple types of epidemics in a very small or a relatively small experiment in here. Now, from the ground, so we have also been collecting visual information and uh, as well as RGB imagery. So the slides are pretty delayed, but we'll get there. Just give us a second here. Okay, so this is what we were seeing from the ground. Uh, for the untrained eye, perhaps you will not be able to notice that there's a small speck right here. So that's a tar spot just at the beginning of the epidemic. But over time, uh, we can see that 
the intensity of the disease will change over and over until the end of the season or pretty close until the end of the season. So more and more disease intensity will be present. So that allows us to process the information, in this case, the visual information, uh, plot the data, extract different parameters uh, that will <coughs> always be associated to, to those epidemics. And so very briefly, what we accomplished with, uh, with Dr. Young was that, so we identify one of those vegetative indices that um, provided high levels of correlation when we compare the visual assessments and the data extracted from uh, those images. And, and so, but something different that we had done <coughs> in this case was to characterize the data at different canopy levels. So mainly thinking that at some point we were going to have occlusion uh, with, with some of those images. What is next? So continue improving accuracy and precision because we're not known yet. Uh, comparison against practical limit of detection and thresholds is very important for management uh, strategies. Tracking analysis of treatments. So we're right in the process of doing that uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, different, different people in the lab and, uh, and also different TIs. And of course, explore the temporal and the spatial description of these different epidemics. Um, so how are we doing in time? Pretty much. Five or eight minutes. If you need. Five or eight minutes. OK, so let's talk very briefly about this last project uh, led by Dr. Uh, Dayon Lee, one of my postdocs. So her approach was a little bit different because when we're looking at proximal sensing imaging, we have the capacity to collect higher resolution data. And so in her case, he came up with the idea to use contour lines and the density of those lines that can be populated around these structures that are produced by the pathogen that we call. And so with that technique, she was able to um, detect and quantify disease. And so uh, there were uh, if you want to know details about the whole process, I highly encourage you to read the manuscript, but uh, I'm going to highlight some of the uh, potential and some of the practical applications that we have demonstrated in that paper. So one, accuracy in disease phenotyping. Uh, second, temporal analysis of epidemics. Uh, we were even able to select best star spot management uh, combinations. And we have compared that information against the visual assessments uh, and the, the information that was extracted with the algorithm. So there are, there are definitely multiple applications. We have also limitations uh, in terms of the automation of, these, um, of the, this algorithm. But anyway, so we are we're working uh, together with Dr. Edward Dell. Uh, and so hopefully at some point, we can come up with a much, uh, much, much better and stronger algorithm in the future. Some people uh, might be asking about forecasting. What are the possibilities of forecasting by using these different methods? So the reality is that there is a potential, but we're not there yet. We still rely on discriminant analysis, logistic regression, mechanistic modeling, and machine learning and AI is, is just starting to be utilized by pathologists and plant disease epidemiologists. So, um, uh, we have been in discussions with several um, uh, collaborators and even potential collaborators. One of them is Dr. Mohammad Jahan Shahi from the uh, uh, Engineering College. And so the idea here is again to continue putting together the pieces of this big puzzle. Uh, our lab is uh, trying to provide the expertise needed uh, from the traditional and the digital epidemiology uh, standpoints. Uh, we're starting to think about what uh, stochastic methods can and need to be used in order to, to combine the different pieces of information to come up with some sort of uh, outcome. It can be a forecasting or it can be a decision system to determine what are the best treatments in, uh, for research purposes. But again, we're not there yet. There's much that needs to be done in the future. And uh, we are fortunate to uh, have multiple collaborators, excellent students, fantastic visiting scholars that uh, 
that are coming to our lab, postdoctoral researchers and, uh, uh, and the like. So uh, a few conclusions here. So we know that disease surveillance is key to the development of management strategies, but there are multiple limitations as I had mentioned before. So not only from the basic knowledge of epidemics, but also because of the lack of tools to collect high throughput data. Um, therefore, we need a careful integration of scientific fields and engineering fields in order to make progress in here. So uh, in our case, we're primarily focusing on two high profile diseases, although we also study other diseases. But in this case, we're trying to make as much progress as possible uh, to make this, this, this happen. So we need tools. We need to transform uh, the way on how we collect the data and, we, and, and how we can make decisions. This is just the beginning. Uh, originally, I need to be honest, we were very skeptic about the utility of imaging, but we have been proven wrong. Uh, we see the utility and definitely we're gonna continue working in this, in this field. Another question, are UAVs the solution to all of our problems? I would say probably not, uh, but it's one platform that we have used for research purposes and uh, we are getting uh, uh, very promising results. Um, again, the process will continue to evolve. Uh, we should not forget about stakeholders uh, because so one portion would be the research part, but also uh, the thinking and the discussions with stakeholders. We have been fortunate to be in contact with companies. And so one of them is Solentech, a local company here in West Lafayette. And so we are slowly starting to uh, test some of these hypotheses that will come in the future. With that, I would like to thank everybody who has participated in this research, uh, key contributors, uh, all the institutions that have supported us, and all, of course, all of our collaborators. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll be more than happy to receive questions if we have it. So, yes. I'll go ahead if there's no others right now. Um, are there, is there comparable work being done with insects and weeds and do some of the same principles apply? The three major pests. I can tell you very briefly, we have started one project where we are, we have invited other PIs, weed, sign, a weed scientists and uh, entomologists. We, have, we don't have data. So, but mm -hmm. what I can tell you is that some of these methods could be used down the road. We have begun to uh, start putting some hypotheses associated um, with the reliability of the tools when you are detecting and quantifying. That's the first question. But now thinking about dynamics and explaining how things are happening, I think that's probably going to be a second part of the research. But yes, so that's happening. It seems like diseases would be the trickiest. Seems like they're a little more mysterious than like a a weed has more of a physical noticeable presence and uh, a disease is you can't see it for the most right. part. And, yeah. yeah, so that's right. So uh, we need, and that's true based on what we know on the ecology, the epidemiology, how things are happening. These are microscopic entities also. Mm -hmm. So very hard to detect on time. So they're very cryptic. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned mechanistic models. In the case of diseases, what are the key variables in those models? Yes, yeah, so for, for many plant diseases, so we know that the standard variables are temperature and relative humidity. However, um, in many cases, we have been proven wrong. So in <clears> some <throat> models, actually, there's one model for tar spot that uh, initially relied on temperature and relative humidity, but the uh, level of accuracy was not the best. So the decision was to start incorporating leaf wetness, which can be another driver. But, but yeah, so I, I think uh, it would depend on the, the system that you're studying. Just a thought in that vein, when we talk about growing, we use the term growing degree days. Most people, most people are familiar with that. It's a day of a certain number of degrees above a base. 
And I'm wondering if there is something like moisture days or something like that, where it's a humidity above a certain level for a certain length of time or some term like that that could be related to this. Absolutely, yeah. So the the uh, what we call it uh, an accumulation. Yes. An accumulation of parameters. Exactly. So, however, for the pathogen being cryptic, we don't completely understand the thresholds yet for many, many pathogens. So, there's little research in that area because it, it, it's very difficult. Actually, you need lots and lots of data in order to determine what is the actual threshold, at which point you need to start making a decision. So, but yeah, great question. Can you make any generalizations about um, there, there's when you, when I think of diseases, there's fungal, there's bacterial and viral, and there's other things too, but those are the three main pathogenic ones that I know of. Can you make, based on your work so far, can you make any generalizations on those? Do some of them tend to start from the middle of the field? Do some of them tend to have a more rapid increase or whatever? You know, what, yeah, what so, would you say on those? Sure. So generalizations will be difficult. I can even within fungi. Okay. Just thinking that there is a single pattern for all fungi, uh, it would be a mistake. And there's but, only like a handful of species, you know. Right. So, uh, exactly. No, there's millions of species. Probably. But but what what I can tell you is that and this is this goes back to trying to understand how these dynamics are happening and um, what we know about the ecology of a specific pathogen. That's, that's very key because that ultimately will define your sampling method, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and early, earlier today, we were talking about aggregation of pathogens. So nematodes, for example, are, are very characteristic to uh, you know, have different patterns if you start collecting. But when you go to the aerial type of pathogens that are dispersed by spores, yeah, so at some point you can have aggregation, but then you also have all the type of patterns that are or cannot be generalized. So, and it depends on the stage of the pathogen, mm -hmm. right? So, multiple dynamics. So, yeah, it's a little bit complex. Yeah. I think there's one more. Yeah. Yes. So, um... From a futuristic point of view, how do you see like all this uh, agricultural, well, digital agricultural revolution can help us to understand better? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, even though I have said that we are not there yet, um, looking at the future, because we always have to look at the future, um, perhaps decisions, and so these were some parallels that we were discussing with. Uh, Paul Lesker from uh, uh, Penn State yesterday. Um, so one of the things is that, uh, you know, for, for human pathogens and how human medicine is moving towards, it's based on data. And what we're looking at is probably a revolution where doctors are going to be giving recommendations based on the data that is coming from each individual. Of course, we cannot do that for plants or you know, even monocultures, you cannot give a recommendation for a specific plant. But if you have enough data, you could perhaps, um, you know, provide a recommendation for a given farm, a given region, a given country. But we need data, right? So, uh, you know, how I see imaging work in the future would be the equivalent of your thermometer, for example hyperspectral and multispectral data. It's not gonna be, tell you specifically what is happening with your crop. It's not gonna be a diagnostic. But at least it's gonna tell you that there's something going on. And so you have to go look closer, start sampling, and use all these different methods that are already available, molecular methods for diagnostics. And even some of the proximal sensing images can help us with, with that too. But yeah, so we're moving towards that. Do you think continuous field scouting plays a role in sports sports between fields and the field? Do you think it's a big role or do you think it's mostly aerial? Repeat the question. I can hear. Do you think 
It's kind of a field of genius to just kind of see who is playing a role in this person of sports as well. Scouting. So people walk in the field. Absolutely. So that that is something that we have identified even with our with last research. There are patterns. People walk in a specific pattern will be detected actually with the spatial temporal analysis that, that we have uh, uh, conducted. But I would say, yeah, it, it depends on the path of entry. Um, is that something that we can do? We can be better in the future? I don't know, because we still need to walk those fields. But maybe another reason why we need to start thinking about better methods that are less invasive. Right. So good question. Do you have any ideas what we can do now to kind of present, prevent that spread? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. Um, let me think a little bit about that. Just um, don't just stop scouting your fields. <laughs> well, yeah, so for a student, it will be fantastic, right? But but yeah, I guess that I'll have to think more about that. Um, because again, so it depends on the stage of the crop. It will be based on the stage of your particular pathogen of interest. There are things that you can do, for example, if you are working on a project where you have non-infected fields versus infected fields. Obviously, you have to start with the non-infected fields. But what happens is that people make those decisions randomly. And they sometimes start with the infected fields and then they move into the non-infected fields. So we can do things for sure, but we need to think more on what we're doing right now. <laughs>